Good afternoon um, and welcome to the webinar. This uh, informational webinar is for people interested in applying to the Department of Energy's Office of Indian Energy's Funding Opportunity Announcement, or FOA, entitled Energy Infrastructure Deployment on Tribal Lands 2020, which was issued November 13, 2019. And I want to thank you all for your patience. Uh, we had a delayed start uh, to allow people to join uh, the webinar. My name is Lizana Pierce, and I'm a senior engineer with the Department of Energy Office uh, of Indian Energy and Deployment Supervisor for the office, otherwise known as the Office of Indian Energy. I've been working in clean energy for the last 25 years, and specifically in Indian energy since the late 90s. Under the Office of Indian Energy, I'm tasked with implementing the deployment program, specifically for financial assistance that entails issuing the funding opportunity announcements, managing the application review process, and administering the resultant grants, and overseeing and funding tribal energy projects. I also have with me Tweedy Doe, who is another project officer with the office, and she is also duty stationed with me in Colorado. Tweedy, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I would. Hello, everyone. This is Tweedy Doe speaking. I um, met Lazana Pierce in about 2002 when I worked for the Council of Energy Resource Tribes, also known as CERT. So Lazana and I go a few years back. I have been with the Department of Energy for about 10 and a half years and with the Office of Indian Energy for um, about three years. As a project officer, I get to work with our grant recipients from start to end uh, of their projects, and I do hope to be able to work with some of you on the phone today. Thank you. And Tweety is uh, one of the four federal employees um, with the Office of Indian Energy. Um, we're a very small office, obviously. We have uh, Kevin R. Frost, the director, um, a member of Southern Ute, and he is located in Washington, D.C. Tweedy and myself are located, uh, duty stationed in Golden, Colorado. And in fact, we're co-located with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, one of DOE's 17 laboratories. And we also have Gibby Kokonowski, who is duty stationed in Anchorage, Alaska. And so as a brief introduction, um, I want to start this webinar. Uh, but because there's so much information, Twitty and I may swap off and on throughout the presentation. Um, I would like to say that I believe that this uh, webinar will likely go two hours, and unfortunately, we had only um, reflected it as an hour and a half. So, so be aware that we will likely run late. Um, however, the entirety of the webinar and the audio will be posted. I believe Monica may have already posted the slides. If not, she'll send a chat out to everybody. So the intent of this webinar is to cover the basic aspects of the funding opportunity announcement, otherwise known as a FOA, and to highlight essential details about the application process, including the types of applications sought, who is eligible to apply, cost share, and other requirements, what the application needs to contain, and how to ask questions and how applications will be reviewed and selected for funding. Before we begin, I'd like to draw your attention to the email address in the lower right-hand side of the cover page. This is the official mailbox to direct all your questions during the entire FOA process. Please do not contact DOE or DOE laboratory staff or contractors directly uh, with any questions, including myself, as all questions must be in the form of writing. The reason for only accepting questions and writing is to ensure you receive a formal response and so that everyone has the benefit of that same response. Because typically, if you have a question, other potential applicants likely have the same question. As we will not have a question and answer session as part of this webinar, please capture your questions as they come up and send them to uh, send them via email to tribalgrants at hq.doe.gov. In the subject line of your email, please include the FOA number, DE-FOA-0002168. Unless a similar question has already been asked, responses to questions received at that mailbox will be posted to the Frequently Asked Questions, or FAQs, webpage 
for this FOA on the EERE Exchange website. Responses to your questions will typically be posted within three business days after receipt. And before uh, submitting a question, please do check the FAQ webpage on the EER Exchange website to see if a similar question has already been answered. In submitting a question, please be careful not to include any language that might be business sensitive, proprietary, or confidential. I will add that your participation in this webinar is completely voluntary. There are no particular advantages or disadvantages to the application evaluation process with respect to your participation in this webinar today. These slides and an audio recording of this webinar will be posted in the next week or so. And as a registrant of the webinar, you will be notified when this material is available on the Office of Indian Energy's website. The slides themselves will be posted uh, later today if they're not already there. <clears throat> and uh, it, you may want to download the FOA document now uh, for reference, as I'll be referencing specific pages as we go through the webinar. So let's get started. Next slide, please. Before we get into the funding opportunity, I wanted to provide a brief overview of the Department and of it, <coughs> pardon me, Department of Energy and Office of Indian Energy. The overall mission of the department is to ensure America's security and prosperity by addressing its energy, environmental, and nuclear challenges through transformative science and technology solutions. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the tribes advocated for an assistant secretarial office within the department, and through the Energy Policy Act of 2005, the office was authorized. As such, the Office of Indian Energy is one of about a dozen assistant secretarial level offices within the department. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the Department of Energy, or DOE's, Office of Indian Energy assists in addressing the staggering gaps and barriers for Indian tribes which for this FOA include Alaska Native Regional Corporations and Village Corporations, Intertribal Organizations, and Tribal Energy Development Organizations interested in developing their vast energy resources. Specifically, the office is charged by Congress to promote Indian energy development, efficiency and use, reduce or stabilize energy costs, enhance and strengthen Indian tribal energy and economic infrastructure, and to bring electrical power and services to Indian land and homes. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and I guess I will apologize. I'm not feeling, um, I'm feeling a little under the weather today, so if my voice comes and goes, uh, please, please forgive me. <clears throat> So our, um, the mission of the Office of Indian Energy is to maximize the development and deployment of strategic energy solutions that benefit tribal communities by providing American Indians and Alaska Natives with knowledge, skills, and resources needed to implement successful strategic energy solutions. You can see just a few of the projects the Office has provided financial support for in the pictures on the right. And I'll give you just a moment to uh, to uh, see, uh, look at those look at those uh, project pictures. And now on to the funding opportunity. Next slide, please. Got it. Thanks. Before we discuss the funding opportunity announcement itself, I wanted to walk you through the EERE Exchange site and where you can find the FOA document itself, um, as well as application forms and frequently asked questions. The EERE Exchange website is, an, uh, is at EERE-Exchange, which is spelled E-X-C-H-A-N-G-E dot energy dot gov. Once on that page, you'll need to scroll down the list until you locate FOA number DE-FOA-000268. Clicking on that FOA number in the FOA list will take you to the section of the webpage specifically for this FOA, as shown on the slide. As you can see on the slide, the section specific to this FOA includes a brief summary and other key information. 
The direct link to this FOA summary is at the bottom of the slide. And my apologies for the legibility of the slide. Uh, the screenshot will be expanded in the next few slides. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So as you can see from this screenshot, the EERE exchange summary for this FOA includes the FOA document itself for download, required application documents, contact information for submitting questions regarding this FOA and for EERE exchange support, and a link to the Frequently Asked Questions or FAQs webpage. And the submission deadline of February 6, 2020 at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Now remember, this is Eastern time, so please plan accordingly and adjust for whichever time zone you are located. If the application documents are not shown, you'll need to click on the View Required Application Documents link under Required Application Documents. Once the View Required Application Documents link is clicked, a list of the required application documents will be revealed, which I'll show you on the next slide. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so as you can see, once you click on the view required application documents under the required application documents, you'll see the various forms and templates that need to be included as part of your application. Note that these are not the entirety of forms and documents that compose a complete application. The form and templates on Exchange only comprise part of the application and in and of themselves do not make a complete application. Further into the presentation, we'll go through all the elements that comprise a complete application. <clears throat> so the forms and templates included here are the application for federal assistance, the SF-424 form, which is a fillable PDF form, the summary slide template, which is a PowerPoint slide intended to summarize your proposed project. The work plan template, a Microsoft Word template and instructions to be used in preparing the work plan for your proposed project. Project metrics data file, which is an Excel file to capture key information on your project. An options analysis template, which is a Microsoft Word template and instructions to be used in preparing the requisite options analysis. There's also an eligibility statements and evidence, which is a Microsoft Word template for information relative to the applicant's eligibility and land status eligibility, the evidence required to support DOE's eligibility determination, and certification of the information by an authorized representative of the applicant. List of forms also include a budget justification workbook, IE 335. This is a multi-tab Microsoft Excel workbook for capturing budget details for the applicant. And if applicable, subrecipients who meet the threshold requirements, which we'll discuss, in the budget forms and the thresholds in more detail later in the presentation. There's also a budget support template, which is a Microsoft Word template that includes additional information and documentation to support your proposed budget. <coughs> Pardon me. Additionally, there's the registration certifications, which is a Microsoft Word document for certification of an authorized representative of the applicant, that the applicant has registered in the various systems needed to apply for and to receive an award under this FOA. And lastly, there's a disclosure of lobbying activities, which is an SFLL form, which is a Word document. And if this does not apply to you, please just indicate not applicable, sign date, and include as part of your application. We'll go into that in a little more detail in subsequent slides. All other components comprising a complete application are self-generated. For a complete list of the application elements, see the table on pages six and seven of the FOA document. Next slide, please.
the answers to all FOA related questions received in our email box, tribogrants at headquarters.doe.gov, will be posted on the Frequently Asked Questions or FAQ webpage specific to this FOA, which is on the EERE Exchange website. This slide shows an example of the FAQ webpage. Please pet. Check this page periodically as questions and answers will continue to be posted throughout the entire time the FOA is open. Please also check this page before submitting the question, as similar questions may have already been answered. Next slide, please. So on the cover page of the FOA, you will find key dates. The FOA has already been posted and we are conducting the FOA informational webinar now. All applications are due on the EERE Exchange website no later than five o'clock Eastern on February 6, 2020. <coughs> Again, note that the closing time is five o'clock Eastern. Um, so please plan accordingly and adjust for whichever time frame, time zone you are located. Also note that DOE will not extend the submission deadline for applicants that fail to submit required information due to server connection congestion. And also EERE Exchange is designed to enforce the deadline specific to this FOA. Therefore, the apply and submit buttons may be disabled at the defined submission de deadline. So please ensure you begin uploading your complete application at least 48 hours in advance of the submission deadline to ensure you meet that deadline and to allow at least an hour to submit an application. Note that once the application is submitted in the ERE exchange, you may revise or update your application up until the deadline. DOE <clears throat> anticipates notifying applicants selected for negotiation of awards the summer of 2020 and in making awards approximately 90 days after receipt of any requested supplemental information. <clears throat> Each and every applicant will receive a notification letter by email to the technical and administrative points of contact that you designate in the, by the applicant in the ERE exchange. So notification letters will state whether the application is determined to be non-compliant, an incomplete or late application, ineligible, which means it does not meet the eligibility requirements that begin on page 24 of the FOA document. The application is non-responsive as defined under section 1C, application specifically not of interest, which begins on the bottom of page 31 of the FOA document. The notification letter will also um, identify whether the application was not selected for funding, was selected for funding, uh, selection for funding was postponed, um, was designated as an alternate, or selected for negotiation towards a reward. And each notification letter, which every applicant will receive, will also state the basis upon which those decisions were made. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so even though we do plan on going through much of the information contained in the funding opportunity announcement in this webinar, I would urge you to read the FOA and then read it again. Next slide. So to apply to the FOA, applicants must register with and submit applications through EERE Exchange at the URL shown here. As previously discussed, frequently asked questions or FAQs for this FOA can be found on the FAQ page specific to the FOA on Exchange. You will also need to register in grants.gov at www.grants.gov so that you'll receive automatic updates when am amendments to the FOA are posted, if any. Note that applications will only be accepted through EER Exchange, not through grants.gov. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Note that the EERE exchange 
registration does not have a delay. However, the remaining registration requirements could take up to several weeks to process. All potential applicants lacking a DUNS number or not yet registered in SAM or FedConnect must complete those registrations prior to submitting an application. And we'll go through those in more detail. Uh, please also see, uh, apologize. Um, it is also really important you register in these other systems as soon as possible as these registrations need to be complete prior to submitting an application. Remember, an authorized representative of the applicant will need to certify that these registrations have been completed and submit that certification as part of your application. See the registration certifications template under the required application documents that we just discussed on the EERE exchange. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The applicants are strongly encouraged to carefully read the funding opportunity announcement, DE-FOA-000-2168, and to adhere to the stages submission requirement. This presentation summarizes the contents of the FOA. However, if there are any inconsistencies between the FOA and this presentation, or statements from DOE or other personnel, the FOA is the controlling document an applicant should rely solely on the FOA language or seek clarification from DOE at the mailbox provided. So if you, and if you believe there are inconsistencies, please contact us by sending an email to tribalgrants at hq.doe.gov. So the agenda to this webinar is as shown. First, we'll provide a summary of the FOA, requirements for the Office of Indian Energy FOA, and required application elements. We'll discuss applications specifically not of interest. We'll discuss award information, go over who is eligible to apply, cost sharing requirements. We'll discuss the content and form of a complete application, application eligibility requirements, We'll also discuss the merit review and selection criteria and process, the registration requirements, which we just mentioned, and how to submit the application and your points of contact, how to submit questions and best practices, and um, then the closing. Just a reminder that we will not have questions and answering session as part of this webinar. So please capture your questions as they come up and send them via email to tribalgrants at hq.doe.gov. Additionally, as I said before, these slides and an audio recording of this webinar will be posted in the next week or so. And as a registrant of the webinar, you will be notified when this material is available. Um, I also believe that Monica has also uh, already posted or will shortly post the slides themselves uh, to the Office of Indian Energy's website. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so we'll begin with a summary of the FOA funding opportunity announcement, the requirements and application elements. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the FOA executive summary beginning on page one of the FOA document includes key information on the FOA. This information is summarized on this and the next few slides. We'll go over this information as part of this presentation, but it is provided here as a summary. There are four topic areas under which you can submit an application as described in the FOA summary, and we'll discuss each topic area in more detail later in the presentation. Note that like, like the last FOA our office has issued, this FOA is also fuel and technology neutral. Subject to congressional appropriations, we expect to have 3.5 million to 15 million to be available and to make five to 15 awards as a result of this funding opportunity announcement. And I'll give you just a moment to read through the slide. Okay, Monica's too quick. <laughs> um, so continued on this slide is an additional key information relative to the FOA. 
as indicated, depending on whether the proposed projects are facility scale or community scale, the FOA establishes minimum and maximum award thresholds. For facility scale projects, oh, could you go back, Monica, one slide, please? There we go, thanks. Um, for facility scale projects, DOE funding per individual award will be no less than 50,000 to a maximum of a million dollars. This applies to topic area one and topic area three A. Enforce com uh, community scale projects from no less than 250,000 to a maximum of $2 million DOE funds. And this will apply to topic area two, topic area three B and topic area four. Awards under this FOA will be grants with a period of performance for of each award of approximately one to two years, but no longer than three years, and it must include the mandatory 12-month verification period. Next slide, please. So continued on this slide, in the next few slides is additional key information relative to the funding opportunity announcement. We will go over the eligible applicant requirements in detail on subsequent slides, so I'll forego the explanation here. Please note, however, that DOE will not make eligibility determinations for potential applicants prior to the date on which the applications to this FOA are submitted. You may ask clarifying questions relative to the FOA, but DOE will not determine whether an applicant or specific project is eligible during the application preparation stage of the process. As such, the decision of whether to submit an application in response to this FOA lies solely with the applicant. Note that per statute, there is a 50% cost share requirement, meaning 50% of the total allowable costs of the projects must be provided as cost share. The total cost of the project is the sum of the DOE share and the recipient share of allowable costs. For instance, if a proposed project is estimated to cost a total of $500,000, the requested cost share would be $250,000, or 50% of the total project cost of $500,000. Next slide, please. As included in the FOA summary on page two of the FOA document, the following proposed projects may be given additional consideration in the selection of, uh, selection of applications for funding. Through the application of program policy factors, which are under section 5C of the FOA. Projects which serve tribal communities with high energy costs, Projects proposed for tribal communities not connected to the traditional centralized electric power grid and applications who have not previously received a grant from the Office of Indian Energy. Furthermore, the DOE Office of Indian Energy may, upon request, provide technical assistance to all eligible applicants who apply under this FOA and whose applications are compre comprehensively reviewed but not selective for negotiation. If the Office of Indian Energy determines it to be within scope and budget, such technical assistance will be provided on a priority basis over those who do not apply to the FOA. Also be aware that you may submit more than one application or more than one application to a particular topic area, provided each application is for a distinctly different project and addresses only one topic area. Each application must have a distinct title, unique control number as assigned by EERE Exchange during the registration process and be readily distinguishable. Next slide, please. <clears throat> also note that a concept paper is not required under this FOA and as mentioned previously, applications will only be accepted through EERE Exchange. 
As was also previously discussed, DOE will notify all applicants of, of its determination via notification letter by email. A notification letter will form, inform the applicants with eligible applications if its application was selected for award negotiations or not selected for award. Those applicants will also receive written feedback at the time of notification. Ineligible applications will not be reviewed or considered for award. If determined ineligible, the contracting officer will send a notification letter by email stating the basis upon which the application is ineligible and not considered for future re further review. Next slide, please. So the requirements included on pages three and four of the FOA document and listed on this slide are not all inclusive and cannot exclusively be relied upon as they do not reflect all the evaluation factors and requirements for the FOA. Applications, applicants, pardon me, applicants must read the entire FOA to determine the complete set of requirements under this FOA. So pre-award costs, except for pre-award costs with prior DOA approval, only costs share contribu contributions during the period of performance of the grant, if awarded, can be considered. Any costs incurred prior to the award selection cannot be considered as cost share or for reimbursement by DOE. Registration requirements. The mandatory registration requirements were previously discussed and are summarized on page three of the FOA, but they're also included under section 6B.1 of the FOA document. Also remember that an authorized representative of the applicant will need to certify that these registrations have been completed and submit that certification as part of your application. Eligibility statements and evidence. As previously mentioned, all applicants are required to submit eligibility statements and to provide evidence of applicant and land status eligibility to support DOE's eligibility determination. Statements of commitment and cost sharing. The statements of commitment and cost sharing will be discussed in greater detail later in the presentation. Just a reminder that an executed tribal council resolution from each participating Indian tribe, a declaration or resolution from each Alaska Native Regional Corporation, Alaska Native Village Corporation, intertribal organization, and tribal energy development organization are required, and a letter of commitment from all other project participants are required as part of the application. See the FOA for instances for where a format other than the Tribal Council resolution will be accepted from a participating Indian tribe. Letters of support. Letters of support by anyone not participating in the proposed project are not required or desired and should not be provided as part of the application. Post award payment. Payment will be made electronically on a reimbursement basis through the Automatic Clearinghouse ACH and approved and provided, pardon me, and provided the requisite support is provided, are normally reimbursed within seven to 10 days. Post award re reporting requirements. Selected applicants will be required to document progress in quarterly reports and the uh, and the project results in a comprehensive final report, as well as present in an annual program review to be held each fall in Lakewood, Colorado. For planning purposes, applicants should plan to attend and present grant activities each year during the period of performance of the grant beginning in 2020. And to include those travel costs as part of your application budget. Equipment title, invested interest. Subject to the conditions provided in 2 CFR 200.313, Title II equipment acquired under a federal award will be conditionally vested upon acquisition with the non-federal entity. The non-federal entity cannot 
encumbered this property or equipment without approval of the federal awarding agency, and you must follow the requirements in 2 CFR 200.313 before disposing of the property. Note that if the federal share of the financial assistance agreement is more than a million dollars, pursuant to the requirements under 2 CFR 910.360 before, for profit recipients, for profit recipients must properly record Uniform Commercial Code or UCC financial statements for all equipment with an acquisition cost of $5,000 or more purchased in whole or in part with federal funds. <coughs> cost share. So every cost share contribution must be allowable under the applicable federal cost principles as described in Section 4. I.1 of the FOA. In addition, caution must be verifiable upon submission of the application. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you. So the content and format of an application will be covered in detail later in the presentation. However, a summary of each of the required application elements is included here and on the next slide, as well as on page six, and seven of the FOA document. I'd like to recommend you use this table as a checklist when preparing an application. Remember, forms and templates can be found on EER Exchange under the Required Application Documents link after clicking the View Required Application Documents under the FOA description. All of the requirement, uh, required components will be self-generated by the applicant. Next slide, please. Shown here are the remaining elements that comprise the complete application. Note that you may submit an application at any time before the due date and that you will be able to update as needed up until that deadline. Please allow sufficient time to ensure you have uploaded all required documents and that your application is complete prior to the due date and time. Next slide, please. So this funding opportunity announcement, or FOA, builds on efforts by DOE to accelerate the deployment of energy infrastructure on tribal lands. Between 2010 and 2019, the DOE Office of Indian Energy has invested nearly $85 million in more than 180 tribal energy projects impl implemented across the uh, contiguous 48 states in Alaska. These projects, valued at over $180 million, are leveraged by over $95 million in recipient cost share. Next slide, please. So please remember that this FOA is fuel and technology neutral. Eligible applicants include an Indian tribe, which for this FOA includes Alaska Native Regional Corporations and Village Corporations, intertribal organizations, as well as tribal energy development organizations are eligible applicants and on whose tribal lands the projects will be located. Note that the applications may also be submitted on behalf of an Indian tribe or tribes by an uh, authorized tribal organization, provided evidence of that authority is supplied as part of the application. Definitions and eligibility are included under Section 3B of the FOA. <coughs> so our funding opportunities are intended to promote energy independence and economic development with the ancillary benefit of providing employment on tribal lands through the use of commercially warranted energy technologies that Native Americans and Alaska Natives believe are best suited to meet their needs their location, and their available energy resources. As such, consistent with the principles of tribal sovereignty and self-determination, and with an all-of-the-above energy strategy, projects sought under the funding under the planned FOA will be fuel and technology neutral. 
If you are familiar with past funding opportunities, you'll notice that topic area one is focused on facility scale energy generation and energy efficiency measures. Topic area two is directed towards community scale energy generation projects. And topic area three for integrated energy systems to power essential tribal buildings during emergency situations or for community resiliency. However, you also notice the addition of a community energy storage under topic area two and the addition of topic area four, which is new and is focused on electrifying tribal buildings. We'll discuss each topic area in more detail. However, I would urge you to review the specific requirements under the topic area of interest. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this matrix, which provides key information on each of the topic areas, is also included on page eight of the FOA. Note that the requirements reflected in this matrix are not all inclusive and cannot exclusively be relied upon as they do not reflect all the requirements for each topic area. Applicants must read the entire FOA to determine the complete requirements for each topic area. To see a more detailed description of each topic area under section 1B of the FOA and definitions are under appendix A. The matrix also identifies which topic areas are intended for systems that are grid connected or not. Specifically, projects to be proposed under topic area 1A, topic area 1C, and topic area 2 are intended solely for energy generation systems that are grid connected. Projects proposed under topic area 1B can be for tribal buildings that are either grid connected or not grid connected. Topic area three can be for either integrated energy systems that are normally grid connected, but can disconnect and function autonomously or independent of the traditional centralized electric power grid, or integrated systems that are normally operate autonomously not connected to the traditional centralized electric power grid. Projects proposed under topic area four are intended for tribal buildings that are currently unelectrified. We'll define grid connected and not grid connected on the next slide. You will also notice that commercially proven warranty technology at the far right of the matrix is a requirement for all topic areas. Additionally, a 12-month verification period is also required as part of any project proposed under this FOA. We'll discuss the required application elements in more detail later in the presentations. However, per the matrix, an energy options analysis is required for all topic areas and a template provided on the EER exchange for that. And either a feasibility study or an energy audit or assessment is required is also required for all topic areas. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so before we get into the topic areas, I wanted to provide a few definitions that will be key in deciding the topic area which might apply to your specific situation. Grid connected for purposes of this fellow means connected to the traditional centralized electric power grid. And the traditional centralized electric power grid refer, refers to the main power grids in the continental U United States, the Eastern Interconnected System, Eastern Interconnect, the Western Interconnected System, known as the Western Interconnect, and the Texas Interconnected System, uh, as well as the interconnected grid system in Alaska that connects Anchorage, Fairbanks, and the Kenai Peninsula. Next slide, please. So projects proposed under topic area four, electrification of tribal buildings are intended for tribal buildings currently unelectrified. Where unelectrified for purposes of this fellow of each tribal buildings not connected 
to the traditional centralized electric power grid, as we've just defined, or an integrated energy system operated independent of the traditional centralized electric power grid. So totally unelectrified. <laughs> Next slide, please. So now on to the topic areas. Under topic area one, which is entitled energy generations in their energy generating systems and or energy efficiency measures, DOE is soliciting applications for the deployment of energy generation generating systems and or energy efficiency measures for tribal buildings. This can include energy generating systems for facilities, tribal buildings, topic area 1A, multiple energy efficiency measures on a tribal building, topic area 1B, or energy generating systems and energy efficiency measures under topic area 1C. Note the projects are to be proposed under topic area 1A and topic area 1C are intended solely for energy generating systems that are grid connected. Projects proposed under topic area 1B can be proposed for tribal buildings that are either grid connected or not grid connected. Next slide, please. So for topic area one, energy generating systems and or energy efficiency measures for tribal buildings, energy generating systems for purposes of this FOA can include combined heat and power systems, conventional distributed generation systems, and renewable energy systems. Energy efficiency measures for purposes of the FOA means the implementation of either a building efficiency measure or an industrial process efficiency measure. Next slide, please. Thank you. <clears throat> so again, under topic area one, all proposed installations must be for either an existing tribally owned or controlled building or tribally owned or controlled buildings that are currently being constructed or planned to be constructed during the proposed grant period. Note that the projects to be proposed under topic area 1A and 1C are again, are intended solely for generating systems that are grid connected. And projects under topic area B, 1B can be proposed for tribal buildings that are either grid connected or not grid connected. Costs associated with the construction of the building or buildings or structures such as a carport unless integral to the energy generating systems being proposed, will not be considered by DOE for reimbursement or as cost share. Only the incremental costs associated with the installation of the energy generating system or energy efficiency measure itself will be considered allocable to the proposed funded project. Remember that a 12-month verification period is required for all topic areas. Next slide, please. So again, under topic area one, for purposes of the FOA, tribal buildings may include single or multiple tribally owned or controlled buildings located on tribal land. Next slide, please. Where a tribally owned or controlled building for purposes of the FOA is a building or buildings where the eligible entity has the authority to augment or modify the building and where the building is either owned by the eligible entity or tribal members, or the eligible entity has a long-term lease, which is a minimum of the useful life of the proposed project. Tribal buildings may include but are not limited to tribal member homes, schools, community buildings, clinics, hospitals, tribal government buildings, fire stations, police stations, radio stations, washing areas, utility facilities such as water waste water treatment systems, tribal casinos, gaming operations, tribal businesses. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So under each topic area, we have what I call must-haves. So 
to be eligible under topic area 1A, which is energy generating systems, <coughs> applications must provide an options analysis to demonstrate that other options were considered and that the proposed energy generating system best meets the overall tribal objectives. It must be based on a feasibility study that demonstrates the availability of the resource and the viability of the proposed energy generating system. And the feasibility study must be provided as part of the application. You must also include an estimate of the energy displaced annually, amount, cost, and percentage through the proposed energy generating systems based on the actual energy use for the existing building or the projected savings for buildings currently being constructed or planned to be constructed during the proposed grant period and must use commercially proven warranty technology. Under topic area 1A again, either a single energy generating system or multiple energy generating systems may be proposed and either a single tribally owned or controlled building or multiple tribally owned or controlled buildings may be proposed. Please note that energy displaced for purposes of the FOA means to take the place of or to supplant one type of energy source for another, such as when coal displaces wood as an energy source. <coughs> energy generating systems for purposes of this FOA include combined heat and power systems, conventional distributed generating systems, and renewable energy systems. Combined heat and power systems for purposes of this FOA include, but are not limited to, integrated systems that simultaneously generate heat and power using energy efficient turbines, reciprocating engines, micro turbines, fuel cells, waste heat recovery systems, which is capturing heat discarded by an existing process and using that heat directly to, uh, to generate power using, pardon me, an existing process using that heat directly or to generate power. Eligibly, eligible combined heat and power systems may be fueled by any fuel source, natural gas, landfill or sewage gas, fuel and gas oils, coal, lignite, coke, biomass or biogas, solid waste, waste gases, or waste processed heat. So energy generating systems may also include conventional distributed generating systems, which for purposes of this FOA include, but are not limited to combustion engines or combustion or steam engines. Energy generating systems may also include renewable energy systems, which for purposes of this FOA include systems that <clears throat> um, for electric power generation and or heating or cooling systems. Renewable energy systems for electric power generation include but are not limited to photovoltaic or solar electric, biomass, including waste energy, wind power, hydropower, either diversion, run of the river, small impoundment, or incremental hydropower, or other renewable energy hybrid systems for electricity power generation. Note that for purposes of this FOA, ground or air source heat pumps are considered an energy efficiency measure. Heating and cooling systems include, but are not limited to, the use of biomass for high efficiency combustion systems, stoves, boilers, active solar thermal systems for space or water heating, wind energy for heating, direct use hydrothermal or geothermal resources for water and space heating, or other renewable energy hybrid systems for heating and or cooling. Again, note the projects to be, broke, to be proposed under topic area 1A and 1C are intended solely for energy generating systems that are grid connected. Projects proposed under topic area 1B, which are for multiple energy efficiency measures, can be proposed for tribal buildings that are either grid connected or not grid connected. And remember, 
A 12-month verification period is required for all topic areas. Next slide, please. Thank you. So under topic area 1B, which is multiple tribal energy measures, applicants must, again, the must-haves as I call them, provide an energy options analysis to demonstrate that other options are considered and that the proposed energy efficiency measures best meets the overall tribal objectives. Based on energy audits or industrial energy assessments that demonstrate the technical and economic viability of the proposed EEMs and those energy audits and industrial energy assessments must also be provided as part of the application. Under topic area 1B, you must also include an estimate of the energy saved annually, the amount, the cost, the percentage, through the proposed EEMs based on the actual energy used for existing buildings or projected savings for buildings currently being constructed or planned to be constructed during the proposed grant period. And again, for all topic areas, you must use commercially proven warranty technology. Note that energy saved for purposes of this FOA means the amount of energy use is reduced by using energy efficiency measures to provide projects and services. Energy efficiency measures for purposes of this FOA means the implementation of either business uh, building efficiency measures or industrial process efficiency measures. Building efficiency measures may include, but are not limited to, building envelope improvements, improvements to the walls, roof, foundation, slab, ceiling, windows, doors, insulation, the installation of energy efficiency equipment, high efficiency lighting, <coughs> pardon me, efficient appliances, air sealing, moisture management, control ventilation, high R value, high thermal resistant insulation, High efficiency windows, efficient heating system, furnishes, boilers, passive solar, efficiency, uh, efficient cooling systems such as air conditioners or evaporative coolers, ground or air, sub, uh, air source heat pumps, energy saving building electrical equipment, and efficient mechanical systems and heat recovery ventilation units. Industrial process efficiency measures may include, but are not limited to, insulating piping, uh, tank walls and roofs, the insta installation of higher efficiency equipment, such as heat exchangers, compressors, boilers, pumps, and fans, minimizing air leaks, optimizing air systems through the use of variable speed drives, and adding or optimizing controls. Note that for purposes of this FOA, waste heat recovery systems in conjunction with an existing power system are considered energy generating systems. Waste heat recovered not in combination with a power system is classified for purposes of this FOA as a process efficiency measure. For purposes of this particular FOA, only energy efficiency uh, for pardon me, for purposes of this particular FOA only, energy efficiency is not the same as energy conservation, which is not eligible under the FOA. Specifically, energy conservation for purposes of this FOA means decreasing energy consumption by using less of an energy service or going without an energy service to save energy. Energy conservation typically involves a behavioral change. It may include meters or other indicators to induce that behavioral change. Again, energy conservation is not eligible. If energy conservation is proposed in response to topic area 1B, the application will be deemed non-responsive and will not be reviewed or considered. Note that projects proposed under topic area 1A and 1C are intended solely for energy generating systems that are grid connected. However, projects proposed under topic area 1B can be proposed for tribal buildings that are either grid connected or not grid connected. And of course, 
a 12-month verification period is required for all topic areas. <coughs> Next slide, please. So under topic area 1C, an energy generating systems can be propo proposed in addition to a single or multiple EEMs, but must meet the requirements for both topic area 1 and topic area must meet the requirements of both Topic Area 1A and Topic Area 1B. Specifically, to be eligible for Topic Area 1C energy generating systems and energy efficiency measures, they must have, again, the must-haves, you must provide an options analysis to demonstrate the other options were considered and that the proposed energy generating systems and EEMs best meet the overall tribal objectives must be based on an energy audit or industrial energy assessment that demonstrates the technical and economic viability of the EEMs and those energy audits or industrial energy assessments must be provided as part of the application. It also must be based on a feasibility study that identifies the need and demonstrates the availability of the resource and the technical and economic viability of the proposed energy generating system. And that feasibility study must be provided as part of the application. You must also include an estimate of the energy saved and displaced annually, amount, cost, and percentage through the proposed EEMs and energy generating systems, which is based on actual energy used for existing tribal buildings and the projected savings or buildings currently being constructed or planned to be constructed during the proposed grant period. And of course, you must use commercially proven warranty technology. Note that projects to be proposed under topic area 1A and 1C are intended solely for energy generating systems that are grid connected. And of course, all topic areas require a 12 month verification period. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. That must be really split. Um, okay, so under topic area two, community scale energy generating systems or community energy storage deployment. DOE is seeking applications for the deployment of community scale energy generating systems or community energy storage on tribal lands, which affect a substantial number of buildings or an entire tribal community. So again, we have community scale energy generating systems, which is topic area 2A, and a new topic area, community energy storage, which is topic area 2B. And again, projects proposed under topic area two, either topic area 2A or 2B, are intended solely for energy generating systems that are grid connected. Next slide, please. So for purposes of topic area two, a community scale project means a project serving a substantial number of the total buildings within a community although no less than three buildings, and provides a substantial percentage of the total community energy load, substantial percentage of the total community load, which must be at least a minimum of 100 kilowatts or BTU equivalent. Next slide, please. For purposes of the FOA, substantial means of ample, or considerable amount. And you can see Appendix A for the definition of community. Note that as part of the technical volume, an explanation and rationale as to how the proposed project meets the community scale requirement and specifically addresses the substantial element is required. Next slide, please. So under topic area two, again, community scale energy generating systems or community energy storage deployment 
All proposed projects or buildings on which systems are proposed must be on tribal lands, must be owned or controlled by the eligible entity, and must benefit the eligible entity, which could be an Indian tribe, intertribal organization, or tribal energy development organization, as well as benefit the tribal community. However, the substantial number of buildings within a community where the energy or heat is to be used do not need to be owned or controlled by the eligible entity. Next slide, please. So again, under topic area two, DOE is seeking applications for the deployment of community scale energy generating systems to or topic area two A, pardon me, community scale energy generating systems to provide electricity and or heating or cooling to a substantial number of buildings or to an entire community. Under topic area two uh, A, either a single energy generating system or multiple energy generating systems may be proposed. The minimum system size, 100 kilowatts rated capacity or BTU equivalent, may be for either a single individual energy generating system or the aggregate of multiple energy generating systems. As previously defined, an energy generating system or systems for purposes of this FOA include combined heat and power systems, conventional distributed generating systems, and renewable energy systems. And of course, all topic areas require a 12 month verification period. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so the must have for topic area 2A is to provide an options analysis to demonstrate that other options were considered and that the proposed energy generating systems best meets the overall tribal objectives. Must also be based on a feasibility study that identifies the need and demonstrates the availability of the resources and the technical economic viability of the proposed energy generating system or systems. And that feasibility study must be provided as part of the application. Additionally, under topic area 2A, you must provide an estimate of the energy, gen uh, energy generated annually, amount, cost, and percentage, for the total community through the proposed system. MOS be a minimum of 100 kilowatt rated capacity or BTU equivalent. MOS affect a substantial number of buildings within a tribal community, which must not be less than three buildings. And of course, use commercially proven warranty technology. Next slide, please. So under uh, topic area 2A, community scale energy generating system applications under topic area 2A must demonstrate the availability of the conventional fuel supply or renewable energy resource for the life of the proposed project. And applications proposing geothermal or biomass systems must also demonstrate the sustainability of that resource. Applications for commercial or utility scale projects intended solely for revenue generation through the export of electricity off tribal lands for commercial scale are not of interest. However, on the condition that the proposed energy generating systems meets the requirements under topic area 2A, a portion of the electricity may be sold provided that revenue benefits the eligible entity and the tribal community. And of course, all topic areas require a 12 month verification period. Okay, so under topic area 2B, which is community energy storage, DOE is seeking applications for the deployment of community energy storage systems that affect a substantial number of buildings or an entire community. 
For purposes of this FOA, community energy storage is intended to provide backup power during outages, increase electric distribution system reliability, which means reducing the frequency of both moment, momentary and sustained outages, reducing the duration of outages, and reducing the operation and maintenance costs associated with outage management. <coughs> Pardon me or provide energy time shifting, which is storing uh, power when it is least expensive and using that stored power during peak demand when prices are highest. And of course, topic area 2B, like all others, require a 12-month verification period. Again, for topic area 2B, community energy storage, community storage systems are not intended to be combined with an energy generating system. I repeat, are not intended to be combined with an energy generating system. If you're interested in that, you need to explore topic area three. Under topic area 2B, either single energy storage system or multiple energy storage systems may be proposed. And the minimum system size of 100 kilowatt hour rated capacity may be for either a single individual system or for multi, uh, the aggregate of multiple systems. Next slide, please. Still on topic area 2B, community energy storage, uh, for purposes of this FOA includes, but are not limited to, batteries, pumped hydro, flywheels, compressed air energy storage, or thermal energy storage systems. Next slide, please. And like all topic areas, they have must-haves, as I call them. So to be eligible under topic area 2B, applications must, Again, like all topic areas, provide an options analysis to demonstrate that the options were considered and that the proposed community energy storage system best meets the overall tribal objectives. And again, a template and instructions for that are included on EERE exchange under the required application documents. You must also be based on a feasibility study that identifies the need and demonstrates the technical and economic viability of the system. And that feasibility stu uh, study must be provided as part of the application. You also must include an estimate of the number of power outages mitigated, improvements in electrical distribution reliability indices, or energy time shifting cost savings for the tribal community by the proposed system. Again, must be a minimum of 100 kilowatt hour rate of capacity, and it must affect a substantial number of buildings within a tribal community, no less than three. And of course, as with all the topic areas, use commercially proven warranted technology and have a 12 month verification period. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Monica. So under topic area three, integrated system uh, energy systems for autonomous operations, DOE is soliciting applications to install energy systems for autonomous power, op autonomous operation to power either a single or multiple essential tribal facilities during an emergency situation, topic area 3A, or to power a substantial number of, of essential tribal facilities for tribal community resiliency. Topic area 3B. Next slide, please. Projects to be proposed under top, uh, topic area 3 can be for either integrated energy systems that are normally grid connected, but can disconnect and function autonomously which means independent of the traditional centralized electric power grid, or for systems that integrate uh, energy systems that normally operate autonomously, which are not connected to the traditional centralized electric power grid. Where grid connected, again, for purposes of this FOA, means connected to the traditional centralized electric power grid. 
the traditional centralized electric power grid, again, refers to the main power grids in the continental United States, which includes <coughs> the Eastern Interconnect, the Western Interconnect, the Texas Interconnect, as well as the interconnected grid system in Alaska that connects Anchorage, Fairbanks, and the Kenai Peninsula. And of course, must have a 12 month verification period. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, essential tribal facilities for purposes of this FOA are those facilities necessary for providing essential functions where essential services, I'm sorry, for providing essential services, where essential services for purposes of the FOA means services that, if interrupted, would endanger the life, health, or personal safety of the whole or part of the tribal community. And I've included a picture here of a casino as they are often used as an emergency shelter. So for topic area three, again, integrated systems for autonomous operation, essential services include, but are not limited to, emergency facilities or shelters, hospitals or medical services, fire service, police services, wastewater, sewage, sewage communication, electricity, natural gas, telecommunication, including telephone, radio, or telephone, television broadcasting, internet connectivity, and broadband speeds and transportation. Next slide, please. So eligible integrated energy systems under topic area three must, as a minimum, provide power for essential tribal facilities and must, as a minimum, include an energy generating systems, controls and management systems, and may or may not include energy storage systems. Next slide, please. Again, as although integrated energy systems must include energy generating systems, controls, and management systems, and may include energy storage, some components may already exist, and therefore not all of those components need to be proposed for DOE funding. However, the integrated energy system as a whole must meet the requirements under topic area three. Next slide, please. <clears throat> as indicated on the preceding slide, the integrated energy systems under topic area three must, again, as a minimum, include energy generating systems and controls and management systems and may include energy storage systems. Where energy generating systems, again, for purposes of this FOA, include combined heat power systems, conventional distributed generation systems, and renewable energy systems, as we previously defined. Energy storage systems, for purposes of this FOA, include, and are not limited to, batteries, pumped hydro, flywheels, compressed air energy storage, or thermal energy storage systems and controls and management systems for purposes of this FOA include, but aren't limited to, supervisory control data acquisition or SCADA systems, power and frequency controllers, voltage regulators, power production systems. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you. So under topic area 3A, which is energy systems um, for autonomous operations, DOE is soliciting, <clears throat> I'm so sorry, under topic 3A, powering essential tribal facilities, DOE is soliciting applications to install integrated energy systems for autonomous operation to power a single or multiple essential tribal facility during an emergency situation. For purposes of the FOA, emergency means a situation that poses an immediate risk to health, life, property, or environment and requires urgent intervention to prevent worsening of the situation. Next slide, please. 
<laughs> and again, our must-haves. <clears throat> so for topic area 3A, powering essential tribal facilities, you must again, as with all of them, provide an options analysis that demonstrates that other options were considered and that the proposed integrated energy system best meets the overall tribal objectives. Again, a template is provided um, on EERE exchange under application documents. You must also provide a feasibility study. Again, this will be self-generated. that clearly identifies the need and demonstrates the technical and economic viability of the proposed integrated energy system. And that feasibility study must be provided as part of the application. You also must include an estimate of the number, frequency, and duration of emergency situations to be addressed with the proposed system. You must demonstrate the ability of the system to function autonomously, which means independent of the traditional centralized electric power grid during emergency situations. And of course, with all the topic areas, you must use commercially proven warranty technology. Next slide, please. Under topic area 3B, tribal community resilience, DOE is soliciting applications to install integrated energy systems for autonomous operation to power a substantial number of essential tribal facilities no less than three, for tribal community resilience. Note that as part of the technical volume, an explanation and rationale as to how the proposed project meets the community scale requirement, specifically addressing the substantial element will be required. Resilience for purposes of this FOA means the ability to anticipate, prepare for, and adapt to changing conditions and withstand respond to and recover rapidly from energy disruptions through adaptable and holistic planning and technical solutions. Additionally, the proposed integrated energy system should increase the reliability of the existing system and make that system more robust. Next slide, please. So for purposes of topic area three, community scale means serving a substantial number of essential tribal facilities, no less than three, within the tribal community or the entire tribal community. Note that as part of the technical volume, again, you, you must provide a rash, uh, rationale as to how it meets the substantial element requirements. Next slide, please. So under okay. So sorry, I'm lost. <laughs> okay. So to be eligible on this topic area three B, <laughs> tribal community resilience. Again, applications must. We have the must have for every topic area. They must have an options analysis. Um. They must be based on a, a feasibility study that clearly identifies the need and demonstrates the technical and economic viability. And that feasibility study must be provided as part of the application. You also must include the estimate of the number, frequency, and duration of adverse situations and energy generated annually, amount, cost, and percentage. You must uh, have affect a substantial number of essential buildings within a tribal community, no less than three, and demonstrate the ability of the proposed system to function autonomously and use commercially proven warranty technology. And of course, like with all the topic areas, it must have a 12-month verification period. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. 
Okay. <clears throat> so for topic area four, this is the new topic area, which is electrification of tribal buildings. DOE is seeking applications for the deployment of energy infrastructure to electrify tribal buildings. It is tended for the deployment of energy infrastructure or integrated energy systems to provide electricity to a substantial number of tribal buildings, no less than three, which otherwise would be unelectrified. And as part of the technical volume, an explanation and rationale as to how the proposed project meets the requirements of substantial number of um, tribal buildings will be required. Projects proposed under topic area four are intended for tribal buildings currently unelectrified. Next slide, please. So for electrification for purposes of this FOA means the process of providing electricity to unelectrified tribal buildings by either deploying energy infrastructure to connect tribal buildings to the traditional centralized electric power grid, or deploying integrated energy systems to operate independent of the traditional centralized electric power grid. Electrify means the act of electrification. Unelectrify for purposes of the FOA means tribal buildings not connected to traditional centralized electric power grid or to an integrated energy system, which currently operates independent of the power grid. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so under topic area four, electrification of tribal buildings, energy infrastructure for purposes of this FOA means electric power distribution technologies to transport electricity from the transmission system to individual consumers and may include, but is not limited to, distribution substations, circuits, circuit breakers, switchgear, bus bars, distribution lines, distribution transformers, capacitors, voltage regulators, meters, and utility poles. Next slide, please. So under topic area four, ener uh, integrated energy systems must as a minimum provide power for unelectrified buildings and must as a minimum include energy generating systems, controls and management systems, and may include energy stores. Again, um, under topic area four, um, integrated energy systems must include energy generating systems, controls and management systems, and may include storage. Some components may already exist, and therefore not all the components need to be proposed for DOE funding. However, the integrated energy system as a whole must meet the requirements under topic area four. And of course, like all topic areas, must include a 12 month verification period. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Nope, oh, there you go. Must haves. So under topic area four, electrification of tribal buildings, applications must, again, provide an options analysis, must be based on a feasibility study, must include an estimate of the amount of energy needed annually, amount, cost, and percentage to electrify those selected tribal buildings, affect a substantial number of tribal buildings, no less than three, And if an integrated energy system is being proposed, demonstrate the ability of the proposed system to function autonomously. And of course, use commercially proven warranty technology. All proposed energy infrastructure and tribal buildings being served must be on tribal land, and the applications proposing integrated energy systems must demonstrate the availability of the conventional fuel supply or the renewable energy resource for the life of the project. And applications proposing geothermal or biomass systems must also demonstrate the sustainability of that resource. And of course, must have the 12 month verification period. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So now that we've discussed each topic area, 
I wanted to again include the matrix summarizing each topic area, and I'll give you a minute uh, to review. I'll also remind you that we will not have a question and answer session as part of this webinar, so please capture your questions as they come up and send them via email to tribalgrants at hq.doe.gov, and in the subject line of your email include the phone number DE-FOA-0002168. And unless a similar question has already been asked, responses to your questions uh, received in the mailbox will be posted to the FO FAQ webpage for this FOA on EERE Exchange. Responses to your questions will typically be posted within three business days after receipt. <clears throat> However, before submitting a question, please check the FAQ's webpage uh, to see if a similar question has already been answered. In submitting a question, please uh, be careful not to include any language that might be considered business sensitive, proprietary, or confidential. <clears throat> Additionally, as I said before, these slides and an audio recording of the webinar will be posted in the next week or so. Um, and as a registrant, you will be notified when this material is available. I believe the slides may be available or will shortly be available on our website uh, today, later today, if not already. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're on two of ten. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, goodness. A lot of information. Again, I don't, I think we're at two hours at least here, so I apologize in advance that we're probably going to run late. Um, next, we're going to talk about applications not of interest. So just a reminder, again, that we are not going to have a question and answer session, so please capture your questions as they come up. Send them to tribalgrants at hq.doe.gov. Uh, slides and audio will be available. Next slide, please. The types of applications on this um, and the next two slides <coughs> sorry, are specifically not of interest and will be deemed non-responsive and will not be reviewed or considered. As the intent of this FOA is the deployment of energy infrastructure hardware, Activities that do not meet the technical parameters specified will be deemed non-responsive. Additionally, applications proposing studies, design and engineering, except final design and engineering, development or pre-construction activities, or any other activity which is, does not directly result in the installation of equipment to generate electricity and or heating or cooling, reduce energy use or enhance energy storage and delivery infrastructure will be deemed non-responsive and will not be reviewed or considered. Also, applications proposing the evaluation of project product marketing opportunities, assessment of manufacturing opportunities, research, design and engineering, excluding final design and engineering, product development, where the construction of manufacturing facilities or buildings will not be considered. Next slide, please. Applications proposing the construction of buildings or structures, such as carports, will not be considered. Only the incremental costs associated with the installation of energy generating systems integrated to energy systems or energy efficiency measures will be considered allocable to the proposed DOE funded project, not the cost of constructing the building or structures, unless those structures are integral to the proposed project. Any application um, where the applicant has already taken irreversible actions regarding the proposed DOE funded project are not of interest. Note that the proposed DOE funded project consists of only the installation of energy generating systems, integrated energy systems, community storage, energy infrastructure, or the installation of energy efficiency measures, not the construction 
of buildings or structures such as carports. Irreversible actions uh, relative to the proposed DOE project only may include, but are not limited to, site clearing, groundbreaking equipment, or systems purchased or installation, or building re renovation or building retrofits. Applications proposing energy conservations, as we spoke about earlier, are specifically not of interest. That's where energy conservation means decreasing energy consumption by the use of energy service or going without to save energy. Energy conservation typically includes a behavioral change. It may only, it may include meters or other indicators to induce that behavior change. Neither are applications for commercial or utility scale projects intended solely for revenue generation through the export of electricity off tribal lands for commercial sale. Again, all of these are not of interest. <clears throat> Additionally, applications proposing the use of material supplies or equipment which are not commercially proven or warranted are not of interest. Remember, all hardware must be commercially proven and warranted. See the definition uh, under Appendix A or more details on technology readiness levels. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so now on to some award information. Next slide, please. The award information included on this slide is also included as part of the executive summary slides on page one and two of the FOA document. DOE expects to make approximately 3.5 to $15 million in federal funds available. The actual level of funding will depend on congressional appropriations. DOE anticipates making approximately five to 15 awards under this FOA and may issue one, multiple, or none of the topic areas. Awards are anticipated to be between one to two years, but no longer than three, including the mandatory 12-month verification period. Uh, please note that there are different restrictions on the minimum and maximum amounts of DOE funding to be requested under each topic area. For facility scale projects, which is topic area one and topic area 3A, DOE funding per individual award varies from no less than 50,000 to a maximum of a million dollars. This is for DOE funding. For community scale projects, which include topic area two, topic area 3A, and topic area four, DOE funding per individual award varies from no less than 250,000 to a maximum of $2 million in DOE funding. Next slide, please. So next we'll discuss eligibility. Now we'll go over the eligibility information. Remember, um, one of the files that comprise an application is the eligibility statements and evidence file. You will be required to complete the template provided and provide evidence to support DOE's eligibility determination. So please see the Microsoft Word template found under required application documents on EERE Exchange. Additionally, DOE will not make sufficiency determinations prior to an application being submitted. Eligibility for an award under this funding opportunity announcement is restricted to an Indian tribe, intertribal organization, or tribal energy development organization, and on whose tribal lands the projects will be located. Other entities will be discussed on an upcoming slide may be able to submit an application on behalf of an Indian tribe or tribes, provided evidence of that authority is included as part of the application. Okay, we're already there. The definition of Indian tribe is as shown on the slide, and I'll give you just a moment uh, to review the definition.
So note that an Indian tribe, which for purposes of this FOA, include Alaska, Native regional corporations, and village corporations. For purposes of this FOA, Alaska Native Regional Corporation means one of the 13 Alaska Native Regional Corporations as defined in and established pursuant to the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, or ANCSA. Alaska Native Village Corporations, or Village Corporations as, uh, for purposes of this FOA, is as defined in and established pursuant to ANCSA. Tribal consortium, which is the plural consortia as defined um, for purposes of this FOA, means a group of Indian tribes that have chosen to submit a single application. And under this FOA, a tribal, cons a tribal consortium, pardon me, is eligible to submit an application provided the application is submitted by a single Indian tribe representing that consortium. Applications may also be submitted on behalf of an Indian tribe or tribes by an authorized tribal organization, provided evidence of that authority is included as part of the application. Tribal organization per public law 115-245 has the meaning given the term in section four of the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act. 25 U.S.C. 5304. Specifically, per 25 U.S.C. 5304, tribal organization means the recognized government body of Indian energy uh, body of any Indian tribe, any legally established organization of Indians which is controlled, sanctioned, or chartered by such government governing body or which is uh, democratically elected by the adult members of the Indian community to be served by such organizations, which includes the maximum participation of Indians in all phases of its activities, provided that in any case where a contract is let or grant made to an organization to perform services benefiting more than one Indian tribe, the approval of each such Indian tribe shall be a pre prerequisite to letting or making of such contract or grant. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the second type of applicant eligible to apply under this FOA is an intertribal organization. Intertribal organization, as defined for purposes of this FOA, means any organization comprised of two or more Indian tribes established under con congressional, state, or tribal law to act on behalf of the participating Indian tribes. Intertribal organizations may include, but are not limited to, intertribal councils, regional tribal organizations or associations, Alaska regional development organizations, and tribal federations. Next slide, please. In addition to Indian tribes and intertribal organizations, tribal energy development organizations are eligible applicants. And I'll give you just a, a minute or two to review that definition. Okay, so uh, projects must also be on tribal lands to be eligible. And again, I realize we're running really late and I apologize for underestimating. Um, to be eligible, proposed projects must also be on tribal lands as defined here. Specifically, tribal lands for purposes of this FOA include Indian land, and we'll go over that in more detail on the next slide. Lands held in fee simple, purchased or owned by the Indian tribe, tribal energy development organization, or other eligible applicant. Lands held under a long-term land lease for the useful life of the proposed project. Uh, note that 
uh, this varies from previous FOAs in that land held under long-term lease uh, is eligible, whereas under previous FOAs, only land held under a federal land lease was eligible. And land that was conveyed to an ANGSA uh, corporation pursuant to ANGSA, conveyed to a native corporation pursuant to ANGSA, and subsequently conveyed to another entity, provided that entity is either a native village or tribal governmental entity, or the land is held, invested, managed for, or on behalf of a native village or tribal governmental entity. Next slide, please. And for purposes of this fellow, Indian land and Indian reservation are defined under the Energy Policy Act of 2005, and as shown here. And I'll just pause a minute and let you read through that. Um, and for purposes, um, next slide, please. And for purposes of this FOA, Indian reservations are defined here and under the Energy Policy Act of 2005. Next slide, please. So questions regarding eligibility. Um, DOE will not make eligibility determinations for potential applicants prior to the date on which the applications to this FOA must be submitted. The decision of whether to submit an application in response to the FOA relies solely with the applicant. And I want to remind you um, that as we will not be having a question and answer session as part of this webinar, please capture your questions as they come up and send them via email to tribalgrants at hq.doe.gov. Also, these slides and audio or a recording of this webinar will be posted in the next week or two. Um, and as a registrant, you'll be notified when that material is available. I believe the slides will be either or on our website now or will be there later today. So going on, next slide. Cost sharing requirements. Uh, next, we'll cover cost sharing. So just a reminder, um, next slide, please. So next, on to cost sharing. Do you want to go back? There we go. Thanks. Um, per statute, the required cost share under this uh, FOA must be at least 50% of the total allowable cost of the project, where the total allowable cost of the project is the sum of DOE share and the recipient cost share of allowable costs. So for example, if the requested DOE costs are 250,000, the cost share would be 250,000, or 50% of the total proposed cost at 500,000. This is not 50% of the D, uh, DOE requested amount. Again, cost share is 50% of the total project costs, which in this example are 500,000. To assist applicants in calculating proper cost share amounts, DOE has included additional cost share information in Appendix B of, uh, to the FOA. Note that except under limited situations and only with prior DOE approval, all cost share must be made during the period of performance of the grant. Section 3B of the FOA provides additional information on cost share types, allowability, ver verification, and payment. Next slide, please. So all cost share must come from non-federal sources unless otherwise allowed by law. Um, and we'll go over that here in the next slide or two. Note that except under limited situations and only with prior approval, all cost share must be made during the period of the grant. Next slide. As previously stated, all cost share must come from non-federal sources unless allowed by law. So included here and on page 35 of the FOA are a few instances where federal funds can be used as non-federal cost share. 
specifically funding under Indian Self-Determination Act can be used as non-federal cost share. Tribal self-government governance funding agreements can be used as non-federal cost share. Next slide, please. Self-determination contract funding, compact funding, and the HOSTA funding can also be used as non-federal cost share. These are just a few um, examples of federal funds that could be used as non-federal cost share. Oops, could you go back, please? Uh, yeah. yeah, sorry about that. Thank you. Um, so if funds from a federal source are being proposed either as additional federal cost, uh, federal funds against the total project cost or as non-federal cost share, as allowed by law, the applicant must provide a commitment letter from the federal agency as part of the application that specifically commits those funds and identifies the statutory authority that allows those funds to be used for the project being proposed. Additionally, if those funds are to be used as non-federal cost share, the commitment letter must also include the excerpt from the statutory authority that allows them to be used as non-federal cost share. These commitment letters will be reviewed to determine allowability by DOE legal and the contracting officer prior to accepting funds as either additional federal project funds or non-federal cost share from other federal sources. Next slide, please. Thank you. The total budget included in the application must include both federal and non-federal cost share, which combined reflect the total project costs. All costs must be verifiable from the recipient's records and be necessary and reasonable for the accomplishment of the proposed project, allocable. And as all sources of cost share are considered part of total project costs, if selected for funding, those cost share dollars will be scrutinized under the same federal regulations as federal dollars. I call federalized. All funds are federalized. They will be scrutinized to the same level, and they all must be allowable, but allocable, and reasonable. Next slide, please. Oh, there you go. Segway. So, cost share contributions. Every cost share contribution must be allowable under the applicable federal cost principles. In addition, cost share must be verifiable at the time of submission of the application. Although cost share requirements apply to the project as a whole, including work performed by members of the project team other than the recipient, the recipient is ultimately the legally responsible for contributing the entire amount of the cost share. Next slide, please. Again, cost share must be allowable and must be verifiable at the time of submission of the application. Please refer to this chart for your entity's applicable cost principles. It is imperative that you follow the applicable cost principles when creating your budget for the application. Next slide, please. <clears throat> cost share can be provided in cash or as in-kind contributions. It can be provided by the recipient, the subawardees, which are subrecipients or vendors, or third party. Allowable in-kind contributions may include, but are not limited to, contribution of time, unrecoverable indirect costs, unrecoverable facilities and administration co administrative costs, rental value of buildings, rental value of land or equipment, not the purchase price only the rental value for the period of the grant and value of a service or other resource or third party in kind contribution. Again, only the rental or lease value of the building's land or equipment and only for the period of the grant is allowable, not the purchase price. Next slide, please. So be aware that there are items that are considered unallowable cost share. If a cost is considered unallowable, it cannot be requested from DOE or 
counted as cost share. This slide provides some examples of cost share that is unallowable. Also see page 36 and 37 of the FOA document for additional examples. And I'll give you a moment to read through those slides. Please take uh, note of that generally any cost before or after the DOE grant period cannot be considered as cost share unless previously approved by DOE. Next slide, please. If an award is made, cost share must be provided on an invoice by invoice basis at, as a minimum, the percentage negotiated. As an example of cost share on an invoice by invoice basis, if an award is executed and an entity is requesting reimbursement of say $50,000 and the cost share is 50%, then the cost share reflected on that invoice must be at least $50,000 or 50% 50 of the total expenditures of 100,000. So, if you spend $100,000, you're requesting $50,000 from DOE, you need to be able to provide cost share $50,000. However, if you are not able to provide the cost share on an invoice by invoice basis, which sometimes happens if you're contributing um, time or, or equipment use, uh, you may request a wa waiver from the DOE contracting officer. Such a request would be made after notification of selection and if selected and prior to award. Next slide, please. So content and form of application. Again, this is gonna be a long section. I'm just gonna warn you. <laughs> Next on the content and form of an application, we'll go over each file as shown on this slide. Remember, each of the files shown on this slide and the next are required to complete an application. A similar table is included as part of the executive summary on pages six and seven, and on pages 41 and 42 of the FOA document. I would urge you to use this list as a checklist when preparing and uploading your application to ensure that all relevant documents comprising a complete application are submitted. And please be, bear with me as I'll be covering a lot of information. Um, applications must include an application for federal assistance, which is Form SF-424. The application for federal assistance is a formal application form for funding. The form must be signed by an authorized representative of the applicant. And by signing, that authorized representative is making certain certifications and assurances. And therefore, the form must either be digitally signed or printed, signed, and scanned before being uploaded as part of your application. Note that our, all forms can be obtained from the ER Exchange webpage under the required application documents. And by clicking that, hyperlinks to the DOE forms and templates will be revealed and you then can be downloaded, completed, and then uploaded as part of your application. The next document is a summary or abstract for public release. Applicants are required to submit a one-page summary of the proposed project for public release. This is not a specific format. However, page 36 of the FOA document provides a list of information that should be included. A summary slide, a single PowerPoint slide that provides quick facts about the proposed project. Slide content requirements are provided in the FOA. and A template is provided as part of the required application documents on the ERE exchange. The technical volume is the key submission describing the proposed project and addressing the merit review criteria. The technical volume must not exceed 15 pages, excluding the cover page and table of contents, as DOE will only review the first 15 pages. See the table beginning on pages 45 of the FOA document for specific content and format of the technical volume. This table provides details on the content for each section of the technical volume. However, briefly, <clears throat> the technical volume should include a cover page, see instructions on page 45, 
The cover page is not counted against the 15 page limit. Table of contents, again, not counted against the page limit. Another element of the technical volume is the executive summary. The project description and outcomes and roles and responsibilities, capabilities and commitments. Again, the table provides detailed instructions on what each of those sections should, should contain. The fifth element is the work plan. The work plan is not part of the technical volume, but to be included as part of is included as a separate file. The work plan should describe the work to be accomplished and how the applicant will achieve project milestones. The work plan must not exceed five pages, excluding the milestone table. See page 57 and 58 of the FOA for specific content. Also, be aware that the work plan template, which includes instructions and example, has been provided on EERE Exchange webpage, again, under the required application documents. A template is also included as Appendix C of the FOA. The project metrics data file is a required file. This file needs to include specific project-related uh, data, including the type of technology, payback period of the project, expected cost savings, type of buildings, number of buildings, installed capacity, cost per installed lot, square foot of building space affected, electricity reliability data, electricity access information, environmental impacts, possible jobs created, and other questions. The Microsoft Excel template has been provided on the EER Exchange uh, webpage under required application documents. You can download that, complete, complete it, and upload it with your application. Options analysis. All applicants are required to submit an options analysis to demonstrate that other options were considered and that the proposed system or infrastructure best meets the overall tribal objectives. An options analysis for purposes of this FOA is a systematic assessment and evaluation of possible alternative approaches available for achieving specific energy objectives and determining which of the options are most effective and provide the best solution to achieve those objectives. <clears throat> Such an analysis is intended to explore all feasible technology alternatives, conventional technologies, renewable technologies, energy efficiency measures, energy storage systems, integrated energy systems, energy infrastructure, and provide evidence that the proposed project choice can actually be implemented and is the best option available among those feasible alternatives. See Appendix A for sample options analysis format. <coughs> Pardon me. A Microsoft Word template has also been provided and this template is available under the FOA required application documents on the ERE exchange. The use of the options analysis template is not required, but the information included within the options analysis template is required. The studies and plans file should include those studies and plans as required for each topic area, as specifically required under each topic area to include either energy audits and or an energy assessment for topic area 1A and topic area 1C, and a feasibility study for topic area 1B, topic area 1C, topic area 2, 3, and 4. All other relevant background or supplemental data may be included under the site and resource map and geographics file. Eligibility statements and evidence file. All applicants are required to submit eligibility statements that document and provide evidence of applicant and land status eligibility to support DOE's eligibility determination. A Microsoft Word template has been provided. This template is available under the FOA required application documents, again, on the ERE exchange. The use of the eligibility statements and evidence uh, template is not required, but the information being requested is required. All applicants are also required to submit a statement of commitment and cost sharing file, a statement of commitment by the applicant and all of the project participants, excluding vendors, is required as part of the application. 
all tribal council resolutions, declarations, res, uh, resolutions, and letters of commitment must be specific to this FOA and include a statement of the level and type of cost share being committed. For Indian tribes, that statement of commitment must be in the form of an executed tribal council resolution. Unless an Indian tribe provides a commitment in a form of other than a tribal council resolution and evidence of the statutory or other legal authority authorizing that form in lieu of a tribal council resolution accompanies that commitment. Such evidence must establish that the commitment submitted carries the same level of tribal leadership commitment as a tribal council resolution. For Alaska Native Regional Corporations or Village Corporations, intertribal organizations or tribal energy development organizations, a statement of commitment may be in the form of a declaration or resolution signed by an authorized representative able to commit the entity. For all other project participants, a letter of commitment must be provided as part of the application. Statements of commitment by applicants must authorize the submittal of the application, commit to the proposed project, identify the total amount and type of cost share being committed, regardless of source, and include a statement of commitment for the specific amount of cost share. Note that the applicant must commit to the entire amount of the requisite cost share, regardless of source, and it must be verifiable at the time of submission of the application. I want to stress here that all cost share must be verifiable at the time of submission of the application. Additionally, although the cost share requirement applies to the project as a whole, including work performed by members of the project team, other than the recipient, the recipient is ultimately and legally responsible for paying the entire amount of cost share. So letters of support by anyone not participating in the proposed project are not required or desired and should not be provided as part of the application. Failure to submit the appropriate tribal council resolution, declarations, resolutions, and letters of commitment with your application may result in your application not being reviewed or considered. For more on statements of commitment and cost sharing, see pages 60, 61, 62 of the FOBA document. So under the resumes file, a resume is required for each key personnel proposed, including the applicant's technical contact, business contact, tribal staff, subrecipients, vendors, or other key people. A key person is any individual who contributes in a substantive, measurable way to the execution of the project. Each resume must not exceed two pages. Save all resumes into a single file for uploading with your application. Remember the table of required application elements beginning on pages 41 and 42 of the FOA can be used as a checklist of the components to be included as part of your application. Okay. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, so now we're going to briefly go through each of the remaining components of the application. Um, and I'm so sorry, I totally underestimated the, the time it would take here. Um, so there's a lot of information to cover. In addition to the components covered on the preceding uh, slide, an application must also include the following files. The Budget Justification Workbook work Form IE-335 is required form and must include both the funds being requested from DOE as well as those proposed as cost share. So let me repeat, the budget and budget justification must reflect all project costs, regardless of whether those funds are being requested from DOE or provided as cost share. The form itself is a multi-tab Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. In addition to the proposed cost, the form requests the basis of estimate for the cost being proposed. The form can be downloaded from ERE Exchange website under, again, the required application documents. The applicants must also provide a separate budget justification on form IE-335 for each subrecipient that is expected to perform work 
estimated to be more than 250,000 or 25% of the total work effort, whichever is less. A subrecipient is a subawardee with a vested interest in the proposed project beyond providing goods and services to the project. If none of the proposed subrecipients meet the threshold above, a subrecipient justification is not required and instead a file stating no subrecipients being proposed meets the threshold requirements and therefore a subrecipient budget justification form is not being provided here as an attachment. Vendor budget information should not be included as part of the subrecipient budget justification, but rather included as part of the applicant's budget support file. A vendor is an entity contracted to provide goods and services within normal business operations. Someone who provides similar services uh, or goods to many different purchasers and operates in a competitive environment. The budget support file, all applicants are required to submit support for their proposed budget to include indirect rate agreements, breakdown of fringe costs, basis of cost estimate documentation, budget support for vendors, request for DOE approval of subawardees selected non-competitively, and other relevant supplemental information. A make Microsoft Word template has been provided. The budget support template is available under the FOA required application documents again on the ER exchange. So the use of this budget support template is not required, but the information included within the budget support template is required. Financial audit, all applicants must provide a copy of the most recent A133 audit, which is for nonprofit state and local governments and educational institutions, or for for-profit entities, a copy of the most recent independent audit. Site and resource maps and graphics files. All applicants must provide a site and resource and graphics file and include any graphics or supplemental to the technical volume, including maps, photographs, or other visuals of the project location or buildings affected by the proposed project. Any other relevant background or supplemental data may also be included here. Excluding the options analysis and studies and plans, which are submitted separately. If you choose not to provide any graphics, relevant background, or supplemental data beyond which is in the technical volume, submit a file stating no additional site resource maps or graphic information is being provided as an attachment, and note that this information may actually be necessary to complement to complete your application and to fully address the merit review criteria. Design an engineering file. All applicants must provide a design and engineering file and include copies of any hardware performance specifications, warranties, engineering drawings, and any other design or engineering data to supplement the technical volume. The re requisite material and or equipment list for any proposed EEMs should also be included here. Note that this information will supplement the technical volume and be used in reviewing technical viability. And again, if you choose not to provide any design and uh, engineering information beyond which is included in the technical volume, submit a file stating no additional design and engineering information to be provided as an attachment. However, note that this information may actually be necessary to complete your application and to fully address the merit review criteria. Economics file. Provide supplemental data to support the economic analysis including as a minimum a cash flow analysis, unless a court includes this part of your technical volume. And again, as with the others, if you choose not to provide an economic information file beyond which uh, is included in the technical volume, submit a file saying no additional economic information is being provided as an attachment. However, note this information may really be necessary to complete your application and to fully address the merit review criteria. And a couple more. Subcontract plan. Subcontract plan is required only if subrecipients or vendors have been have not been selected. A subcontract plan should include include the description of the selection process to be employed, statement of work, 
and criteria to be used for selection. A subcontract plan may be supplemented by excerpts of the applicant's procurement policy and procedure documents. Any project participants not competitively accepted must be approved by DOE. You can see the um, budget support file for instructions on the content of the request to DOE for approval of any non-competitive selections. If you have selected your subrecipients or vendors, please submit a file stating that a subcontract plan is not applicable as subawardees proposed under the application have been sel selected non-competitively, and as such, a request for DOE approval is being submitted as part of the budget support file. Registration certifications. As we discussed previously, all applicants must certify that all systems registrations have been completed and certify that those registrations as part of the registration certification file. A Microsoft Word template has been provided. The registration certification template is available under the FOA required application documents, again, on the ERE exchange. The use of the registration certification template is not required, but all that information and uh, signatures is required. Disclos disclosure of lobbying activities form is required to be submitted regardless of whether the funds are being paid or will be paid for influence on, or attempting to influence persons in conjunction with this application. Recipients and subrecipients may not use any federal funds to influence or attempt to influence directly or indirectly congressional action on any legislative or appropriation matters. All applicants are required to complete and submit the SFLL disclosure of lobbying activities, and disclose if any non-federal funds have been paid or will be paid to any person for influencing or attempting to influence any of the following, an officer or, or employee of any federal agency, a member of Congress, or an officer or employee of Congress, an employee of a member of Congress. If no non-federal funds have been paid or will be paid to any person influencing or attempting to influence any of the above in connection with your application, indicate none and sign and date the form. This form is available again, as with all the other forms, under the uh, Funding Opportunity Announcement Required Application Documents on EER Exchange. All work under the DOE funding agreements must be performed in the United States. This requirement does not apply to the purchase of supplies and equipment. I repeat, all work under DOE funding agreements must be performed in the United States. However, this requirement does not apply to the purchase of supplies and equipment, so a waiver would not be required for foreign purchases of these items. However, the recipients if an award is made, to make every effort to purchase supplies and equipment within the United States. If work is to be performed outside the U.S., a waiver must be requested. For more information on the contents, you can see Section 4H3 of the FOA document. If work will not be conducted outside of the United States, or you don't need a waiver, um, submit a file stating a waiver to perform work outside of the United States is not being requested under this application and submit. To ensure you are submitting all required elements of an application, I would again urge you to use the table beginning on page 41 of the FOA document as a checklist. Note that you may submit an application at any time before the due date and that you will be able to update as needed up until the deadline. And please, please allow sufficient time to ensure you have uploaded all requirement documents and that your application is complete prior to the due date and time. Next slide, please. Application eligibility requirements. Oh my gosh. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I really underestimated that. <laughs> As we previously pointed out, the applicants must submit applications no later than 5 o'clock Eastern Time on February 6th. 
Note that the deadline is 5 o'clock Eastern, so please plan accordingly. Once submitted, DOE will conduct an eligibility review. An application will be deemed eligible only if the applicant is an eligible entity and located on tribal lands, referred to Section 3 of the FOA. Another eligibility requirement is cost share. The required cost share must be at least 50% um, of the total allowable project costs. Remember the sum of both the DOE share and the recipient share of allowable costs equals the total allowable costs. The application is eligible if it complies with the content and form requirements, means it has all the elements we just spoke about, and the applicant successfully uploaded all the required documents and clicked submit prior to the deadline. In other words, the complete application submitted by the deadline. <clears throat> And four, an application is eligible if the proposed project is responsive to the intent of the FOA. So see Section 1 and Section 3D of the FOA. Specifically, any application is not responsive to the intent of the FOA as described in Section 1A and 1B or identified as specifically if not of interest in Section 1C will be deemed non-responsive and not reviewed or considered. And the application is eligible if it meets the eligibility requirements in Section 3 of the FOA. Please be aware that DOE will not make eligibility requirements um, prior to the date that the applications are due and the decision on whether to submit an application is solely lies solely with the applicant. In other words, DOE will not advise you or make a determination on whether your entity or your proposed project are eligible prior to an application being submitted. So please do not seek advice from any DOE employee, DOE contractor, or laboratory staff. If you have clarifying questions, submit them to tribal grants at hq.doe.gov. Next slide, please. <clears throat> We're going to go really quick. I'm going to talk really quick. <laughs> Mayor review and selection criteria process. Um, just a reminder, uh, we're not going to have question and answers as part of this webinar, otherwise it'll go till midnight. <laughs> so capture your questions, send them to tribalgrants at hq.doe.gov. Merit review and selection process. The merit review and selection process consists of a series of reviews, including an initial eligibility review, of which we just spoke, a rigorous technical review, and programmatic review. The rigorous technical reviews are conducted by reviewers that are experts in the subject matter of the FOA. Ultimately, the selection official considers the recommendation of the reviewers, along with other considerations such as program policy factors, to make a selection decision. Next slide, please. This slide reflects the multi-tier review process, which begins with an eligibility review. And if an application and applicant is determined eligible, the application undergoes a comprehensive technical review consistent, consisting of independent reviewers by subject matter experts who provide ratings and document strengths and weaknesses of each application relative to the merit review criteria that's published in the FOA. After the independent review meeting concludes, a federal consensus board begins its review. The federal consensus board's primary responsibility is to determine the technical merit of each application, which is an inherently government or federal duty, and makes its selection recommendations based on technical merit. In other words, to determines the selection range. Following the federal consensus board, a merit review advisory report is produced, which describes all the merit review process that was conducted, sets forth the federal consensus board technical ratings, addresses the FOA specific program policy factors, and any other selection factors set forth in the FOA. Finally, the selection official reviews the merit review advisory report, considers the recommendations of the federal consensus board, implies program policy factors, if applicable, and makes a selection decisions for negotiation and award. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Technical merit review criteria. This is what the application will be reviewed against. 
The four criteria and their weights are goals and objectives weighted at 10%. The options analysis, which is required again by every topic area, is also weighted at 10%. Project description and outcomes. This is the technical, economic viability and outcomes of the proposed project. It's weighted at 45%. Roles, responsibilities, capabilities, and commitments are weighted at 25%. And then the work plan, of which the template is provided for you, is weighted at 10%. Next slide, please. You'll see on this slide and on page 72 of the FOA document, criteria one, goals and objectives, in the three sub-criteria that will be reviewed relative to that criterion. So please see pages uh, 72 through 74 of the FOA document for the merit review, uh, technical merit review criteria if you are following along. Also note that the content of the technical volume is described in the table as we spoke on pages uh, for, beginning on 45 of the FOA document and the content of the work plan uh, described in the table beginning on page 57. These tables follow the same order and describe the required content on which this criteria will be applied. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So criterion two options analysis is weighted at 10%. The uh, rating will be based on the credibility of the options analysis that demonstrates that other options were considered and the proposed project best meets the overall tribal objectives. As indicated previously, all applicants are required to submit an options analysis to demonstrate that other options were considered and that proposed energy generating systems um, best meet the overall tribal objectives. An options analysis for purposes of this FOA is a systematic assessment and evaluation of possible alternative approaches available for achieving specific energy objectives and determining which of the options are the most effective and provides the best solution to achieve those objectives. Such an analysis is intended to explore all feasible technology alternatives, conventional technologies, renewable technologies, energy efficiency measures, energy storage systems, integrated energy systems, energy infrastructure, and to provide evidence that the proposed project choice uh, can actually be implemented and is the best option available among those feasible alternatives. You can see Appendix C for a feasibility uh, for a sample options analysis format or download it from EERE Exchange. Next slide, please. Criterion three of the project description and outcomes is weighted at 45%. This includes four sub-criteria, clarity and completeness of the detailed project description, technical viability of the proposed project, economic viability of the proposed project, and outcomes. This is the meat of your technical volume. Note that the last three uh, sub-criteria include multiple elements and that that criterion will be reviewed against. And I'll give you a moment to read through the sub-criteria on this slide in the next. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and here are the last two sub-criterion sub that comprise criteria three. And I'll give you just a moment to look through those. Again, economic viability and outcomes. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So the fourth criterion, roles, responsibilities, capabilities, and commitments is weighted at 25%. And this includes the soundness of the project management approach. And we just described that. Um, in the sub bullets here, and the demonstrated level of commitment of the applicant in each participating organization. And that would be in, in evidenced by past energy related efforts or the commitments of the proposed project as evidenced by letters of commitment. 
again, I'll give you just a moment to, to look through those. <clears throat> Next slide, please. The, <clears throat> the fifth and final criterion is the work plan, and this is weighted at 20%. Work plans will be reviewed based on clarity and completeness of the narrative description, the narrative description of each activity necessary to complete the project and the likelihood of achieving project objectives through logical task structure. Remember, a work plan template is included on EERE Exchange under the required application documents and is in, uh, shown as Appendix C of the FOA document. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Selection factors. <coughs> Pardon me. The selection official may consider the merit review recommendations, the program policy factors, and the amount of funds available in arriving at a selection decision. Next slide, please. After the technical merit review, the selection official may consider program policy factors shown here uh, to come to a final selection decision. The program policy factors are included here and on page 74 and 75 of the FOA. The selection official can uh, consider in no particular order geographic distribution, technology, diversity, degree to which the proposed project optimizes the use of available funds, whether the proposed project serves tribal uh, communities with high energy costs, tribal communities not uh, connected to the traditional centralized electric power grid, and applicants who have not previously received a grant from the Office of Indian Energy. Next slide, please. Registration requirements, uh, mandatory registration requirements. Next slide. So to apply, apply to this FOA, applicants must register with and submit application materials through EERE Exchange, if you haven't guessed it yet. <laughs> um, the control number will be assigned while you're registering in the EERE Exchange. You need to retain this control number. It will uh, be put on every file um, as part of your application. It's going to be used as an identifier. Uh, failure to complete the registration uh, requirements below prior to submitting an application could result in DOE determining that the application is not qualified to receive federal funds. <clears throat> so again, if you are at all interested, I would urge you to uh, go through these uh, registration processes as soon as possible. There are several one-time actions required bef before submitting an application in response to the FOA. It is vital that applicants address these items as soon as possible, as some actions may take several weeks. And failure to complete them prior to submitting an application could result in DOE determining that the applicant is not qualified to receive federal award and, and use that determination as a basis for not considering their application. The applicant will be required to certify that these registrations have been completed and to include that certification as part of their application. Therefore, it is essential that these registrations, again, be completed as soon as possible as they may take several weeks to, to process. See section uh, 6.B of the FOA, pages 78 and 79, for more information on required registration. Next slide, please. Application submission and points of contact. <clears throat> Moving on. Um, we're not going to have a question and answer session as part of this. Submit all your questions to tribal grants at headquarters.doe.gov. Audio recording and slides will be made available, um, and you'll be notified of such. I think the slides are already on the web page. Next slide, please. Means of submission. All required submissions must come through EURE Exchange System. Oh, you want to go back one, Monica? Thank you. Um, DOE will not review or consider applications submitted through any other means. So please see uh, the user's guide for applying to the Department of Energy funding opportunities found on the EERE exchange under manuals. It's going to be a step-by-step -step guide, includes screenshots on how to register and how to submit applications into the system. 
Please note that for this FOA, there are no pre-application documents such as concept papers or letters of intent, nor will you be able to, um, to reply to reviewer comments as reviewer comments will not be provided to applicants and after selections are made. So disregard those sections of the uh, user guide, but the user guide is very helpful in submitting your application. Next slide, please. Key submission points. Um, <clears throat> so please check all your entries in ERE exchange. Uh, submissions could be deemed ineligible due to incorrect entry. Uh, DOE strongly encourages applicants to apply uh, submit applications one or two days prior to the deadline. Again, um, you don't want to have difficulties at the last minute. Um, this will allow for full upload of application documents and avoid potential technical glitches. Make sure you push the submit button. You must push the submit button before the deadline. Um, any changes made if you uh, submit early, um, you have the ability to change or re-upload re applic uh, application elements um, if you need to prior to that due date. And then resubmit to push the button again. For your records, I would recommend that if you have difficulties, uh, print out all of your EER exchange confirmation pages at each step. Um, if you experience issues prior to the deadline, you should contact the Exchange Help Desk for assistance. The Exchange Help Desk and or the Exchange um, ERE Exchange System Administrators may be able to assist applicants in resolving those issues. The Office of Indian Energy is not able to assist with technical systems issues associated with ERE Exchange or the submittal of an application. Applicate, applicants that uh, experience issues with, submission, with submissions that result in late submissions should contact, again, the ER Exchange Help Desk, and they may be able to assist. So I would strongly encourage you to keep records and or documentation, including screenshots, if you have any issues or experience um, in submitting your application and, and document any efforts you made to resolve those issues. And then contact us at uh, tribalgrants at headquarters.doe.gov with, with that documentation. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so in addition, uh, uh, Per page 87 of the FOA, please keep in mind that all information provided by the applicant must, to the greatest extent possible, exclude personally identifiable information, and that includes resumes. Um, so by way of example, applicants must uh, screen resumes to ensure they do not include PI, such as personal addresses, phone and cell numbers, personal emails, social security numbers. In short, if PII is not essential to the application, it should not be in the application. Next slide, please. Applicants must designate a primary and backup point of contact in the ERE exchange with whom DOE will communicate during the process. Remember that these are the contacts that will be used to notify applicants of whether their applications are deemed non-responsive, non-compliant, unsuccessful, or selected for negotiation of award. It's imperative that the applicant select the to be responsive during the award negotiations and to meet negotiation deadlines. And failure to, to, to do that could uh, result in cancellation of further award negotiations and or rescission of the selection. So again, if you are selected, you need to be responsive. Next slide, please. Follow questions. Next slide. Gas. Where do you sub submit questions? Tribal grants at headquarters.doe.gov. Um, however, before submitting the question, check the frequently asked questions, the FAQs page on the ER exchange, some of your questions may have already been answered. 
We will attempt to answer questions within three business days, and you will be notified when a response to that question is posted. Next slide, please. Contact EERE Exchange Support at headquarters.doe.gov for problems logging into EERE Exchange or uploading and submitting applications documents. Um, specific questions regarding the FOA itself, again, should be sent to tribal grants at headquarters.doe.gov. And then please include the FOA number on the subject line in those emails. Next slide, please. Best practices. Next slide. In closing, a few recommendations. Um, please download the funding opportunity announcement and read it thoroughly and then read it again so you understand all the steps and requirements needed if you're interested in submitting an application. Do not rely solely on this webinar. If you are considering submitting an application, please register an ERE exchange as soon as possible. You need that control number. That control number must be included on all application documents. Also, check the frequently asked questions on the ERE exchange periodically for any supplemental information or amendments to the FOA. Next slide, please. In closing, next slide. A few final comments. Hey, we're almost there. Last stretch. Hot dog for the 60 people that are still with us. <laughs> Okay, hopefully we've answered some of your questions and provided an overview of the FOA and the process. And again, I cannot apologize enough for how poorly I estimated the time of this FOA. <laughs> um, however, if you have any questions, send us uh, send them to us via email um, at tribalgrants at headquarters.doe.gov. Those come to the Indian Energy team. Um, uh, please don't ask any questions of me, of any other Office of Indian Energy staff, contractors, or laboratory personnel about the eligibility of your project or any other questions related to the FOA. As only formal responses posted under the FAQ webpage will be honored. The purpose of accepting only written questions is that typically if you have a question, someone else has the same question. Um, it also ensures that everyone has the same information relative to this competitive opportunity. Remember, registering in grants.gov means you'll receive email notices of any amendments to the FOA, but applications will not be accepted through grants.gov. Consider submitting an application early. You could always revise or update the file up until the application deadline. <coughs> I'd also like to invite you to join the Office of Indian Energy email list. Uh, to join, see the main page of our uh, website at www.energy.gov forward slash Indian Energy or Google Office of Indian Energy. By subscribing, uh, you'll receive any information on this funding opportunity announcement, funding opportunities through other agencies, training opportunities, webinars, and other upcoming events. In fact, we have a webinar on microgrids tomorrow if you're interested. For information on previously funded tribal energy projects, see projects on our website. Uh, we have a list of other open funding opportunities. See funding. The Office of Indian Energy also offers technical assistance at no cost to tribes and tribal entities, so if you're interested, please check out the technical assistance section of the website and submit a request. These slides and an audio recording of this webinar will be posted in the next week or so. As a registrant, you'll receive an email when that material is available. Note that if there are uh, any inconsistencies between the funding opportunity announcement, this presentation or statements from DOE or other personnel, the FOA document is the controlling document and applications, uh, applicants should rely solely on the FOA language or seek clarification by sending a question. Next slide, please. <laughs> and thank you for your attention and have a wonderful afternoon. This concludes today's webinar. Goodbye.